All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you've given us, Lord, to uh, to hear your word, to preach your word, to study your word. I just pray that you would be with us now, be with me now as I preach your word, that I would say what you want me to say by the power of the Holy Ghost, and that your word would go forth and convict hearts as it should. It is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. I pray, Lord, that your word would break the rocky, stony hearts that need to be broken, that you may sow the word of God on, the, on that good soil, that it may produce fruit and salvation. And those that are saved, they need convicting and repentance, that you grant unto them repentance and chasten them and help them to repent and to show, and everyone would be edified and built up in their most holy faith. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, this message I have today, the Lord gave me this morning, and uh, I've been burdened about this message all day today, and this message is called, The Way of Cain, When Envy Leads to Murdering Your Brother. We're going to start in the epistle of Jude, starting in verse 3. The Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And the question is, why? Why is he exhorting them that they should earnestly contend for the faith? Why do they need to do that? And he says, he explains why in the next verse, verse 4. 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. These men are crept in unawares. They come in quietly. They come in secretly. No one suspects them to be wicked men. Everybody thinks that these men are Christians. But they're not. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. These are ungodly men that creep, creep in unawares. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now oftentimes, we talk about this verse, and we say, oh, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. They just use it as a license to sin. And normally we think about liberal Christians, modern day emergent church Christians. But we don't often think about those that hide under a more subtle cover. Those that outwardly say that they live holy, that they live separated, that they don't live in sin, but they use that false grace as a cover for their lasciviousness, which they do in secret. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And the way that they deny the Lord God, the way that they deny our Lord Jesus Christ is not by their words. It's by their actions. They practically deny the Lord. As Lord. And if we skip down here to verse 11, if you read in verse 11, the first thing that God says about these people in this verse is, Woe unto them! That word woe is God's judgment. In the book of Revelation, there are seven angels and seven plagues, there's seven trumpets and seven vile judgments. And one of the trumpets, one of, the, one of those judgments, there's a couple of them, they're called woes. Those judgments, those plagues that God pour, when he pours out his wrath from heaven, they're called woes. And here God says, woe unto them. That means God's judgment is sure, it is set against them. And it will come to them one day. Why? Here we come to the main part of the text, the main part of the message now this is the reason that the woe is upon them for they have gone in the way of Cain they have gone in the way of Cain so we're going to look at today we're going to study what the Bible says the way of Cain is we need to know what the way of Cain is because if there is such sober judgment against and woe against those that have gone in the way of Cain then we should make sure we know what the way of Cain is so that we don't go in the way of Cain. 
Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for a reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Then we get a description. We start to get a description of what these type of people, what type of people these are. What are they like? What are their characteristics? What are their fruits? God shows us, starting in verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. What does it mean they feed themselves without fear? They don't have the fear of God. They don't have the fear of God. You ever meet someone and they have no they call themselves a Christian, but they have no problem sitting down and eating without praying and thanking God for their food. That shows a lack of fear. Shows a lack of being thankful to God and a lack of reverence and fear of God. They don't thank God for every meal that they have, especially if they're in the presence of other Christians. Feeding themselves without fear, no fear of God. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. What is this describing? What good are clouds without water? And what good are trees without fruit? They're good for nothing. They look like the genuine article, but do not have the substance that actually helps anyone. What good is a cloud in the sky that doesn't bring rain, that feeds the crops, that helps the plants to grow? It's good for nothing. What good is a tree that doesn't have any fruit? It doesn't help man. It doesn't help beast. It just sits there and it takes up. What did Jesus say about the tree that had no fruit? He, they said, why cumber it, cumbereth it the ground? It's just taking up space. Cut it down. It's useless. If it has no fruit, it's useless. So what is the Bible describing here? It's describing something that appears like it could be useful, it should be useful, like a cloud or a tree, but it doesn't have the substance that it should. A tree without fruit, well guess what, the tree without fruit still looks like a tree. You see it there, it's a tree, it has the roots, it has the trunk, it has the branches, but it has no fruit. Just like those that say they're Christians. They look like a Christian. They say they're a Christian. They might dress like a Christian. They might hang out with Christians. They might go to church with Christians. But the fruit shows they're not a Christian. They have no fruit, according to the Word of God. What else does the Bible say about these people? Raging waves of the sea. They're restless. Raging waves of the sea. Foaming out their own shame. You know, the Bible talks about another verse that they glory in their shame, whose God is their belly. They don't even care that they do shameful things. They act in shameful ways, but they have no care. They have no self-awareness that they're acting shameful. They just foam out their own shame for everyone to see, and they don't even care. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, So Enoch, in the Old Testament, before Jesus even came, the first time, he was preaching about the second coming of Christ. But what was he preaching about? It says, Enoch prophesied of these. Enoch prophesied in the future. He, he saw in the future, God showed him that these people that would come, these people that say that they're Christians, but they're clouds without water and trees without fruit. And then he explains what these people are like. And he explains the judgment upon them when Jesus Christ returns. And Enoch also prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed 
and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. All their hard speeches, all their hard speeches, excuse me. Their hard speeches. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. These ungodly men are good public speakers and preachers that only want to benefit themselves. That's who they are. They have great swelling words. They have hard speeches. Why? Because they have men's these swelling words and hard speeches are evidence of their pride and self-confidence. They have confidence, all right, but it's not in Jesus Christ. It's in themselves. That's where their confidence is, and that creates pride. And you can see their pride foaming out their own shame. They have great swelling words. They are able to sound like great preachers. They are able to sound like they believe the truth of the Word of God. They're able to sound like they really believe this book, but they don't. They only care about themselves. All they care about is having men's persons, they want the respect of men, in admiration because of advantage. It advantages themselves. They gain an advantage from preaching what they preach. Their object is not to glorify God. They don't care about that, even though that's what they say that they do. Because they say but they do not. They say with their words, with their lips, this people draw nigh unto me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Continuing on in Jude, verse 17, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Mockers. Mockers in the last time. In the time that we're living now. In the last days. You remember in another place in the Bible it says, in the last days there shall come scoffers walking after their own lusts. This is the same thing. Mockers and scoffers. Right here it says, there should be mockers in the last time. These fake Christians are characterized by their mocking. Their mocking is fruit and evidence that they walk after their own ungodly lusts. You want to know how someone walks after their own ungodly lusts? They don't, you don't necessarily have to see that they are. Or they don't have to tell you, but you can tell by the fruit of their life and by the fruit of their mouth. If their life is characterized over and over again by mocking and scoffing, they're walking after their own ungodly lusts. Who their God is their belly. Verse 19, still describing the same group of people. These are professing Christians. These be they who separate themselves. Sensual, having not the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. These be they who separate themselves. Sensual. They do not separate themselves from sin and the world in a biblical way. That's what they like to make you think. I'm separated. I'm separated from the world and all these ungodly things. I live, I live a whole I strive to live a holy life for Jesus. These people may tell you that. They do not separate themselves from sin in the world in a biblical way, but in a cult-like way. How do you know? with a self-righteous attitude that everyone outside of their group are evil devils and fools. And they talk down to everyone who disagrees with them in an arrogant and condescending tone. That's how you know they have separated themselves, not in a godly way, not in their true holiness. The Bible says true holiness separated from the world and sin unto God. They've separated themselves from many worldly things, but not unto God. It's for their own benefit. It's to make them feel like they are better than other people. 
That's why with their words, they treat people in an ungodly way with their mocking and their scoffing and their self-righteousness. That's how you know that's the motivation for why they're doing what they're doing. So they feel like they are better than other people. It has nothing to do with separating from these things because they want to please God. That's not why they do it. And they fool many people with their fake separation. But they don't fool God. Verse 20, But ye, beloved, we, the true believers, those that are saved by the power of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be different. We are not supposed to be like these trees without fruit, these clouds without water, these wandering stars foaming out their own shame, these raging waves of the sea. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And what do we see here in verse 21, which is so important? Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's what it all boils down to. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Because you can't do anything in this Christian life without the love of God. If you don't love God, if you don't know God's love towards you and you don't love God, you can't love your neighbor, you can't do anything. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. To avoid being like these clouds without water, we need to keep ourselves in the love of God through prayer and building up our faith with the Word of God daily. That's how we make sure that we're not like those people. Not in a self-righteous way, just in obeying God. We do not want to be like that. We want to be like Christ, keeping ourselves in the love of God. Those people that Jude is talking about, that go in the way of Cain, they don't know the love of God. They don't know the love of God. And we're going to show you how in the Word of God right now. Okay, so that described the people, the characteristics of the people who go in the way of Cain. They're religious people. They profess to be Christians, but they're not. And they put on a really good show. But let's learn more about what the way of Cain is. And obviously, in order for us to do that, we should go back in the Bible where it first talks about what happened with Cain. About what happened with Cain. What is the way of Cain? Going back to Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare another, his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. How did Cain react to this? And Cain was very wroth. And his countenance fell. He was angry. He was full of wrath. He was upset. And his countenance fell. Because God did not accept his gift. God did not accept his gift. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you angry? Why are you upset? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. So, so after Cain was angry, he was upset about this, what did he do? And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Cain killed his brother. Cain murdered his own brother. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? 
And he said, I know not. He lied. He was a liar. He knew what happened to his brother. He knew that he killed his brother. But he told God, I know not. I don't know what happened to my brother. Am I my brother's keeper? And God answered him and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. He made Cain a gypsy, a vagabond, never to have a permanent home. Why? Because he was cursed. Because he has shed his brother's blood, innocent blood. The question is, why? Why did Cain kill his brother? Why did Cain kill his brother? Turn in your Bible over to 1 John chapter 3. First epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 10. We read starting in verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Children of the devil don't love their brother. That's how you know the difference between the children of the God, of ch children of God and children of the devil. Children of God love their brother. Children of the devil hate their brother. Kill their brother. Murderers. Verse 11 says, For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as king. Not as Cain. It goes back, John the Apostle, when he's talking about loving your brother, when he's talking about the difference between the children of God and children of the devil, he goes back to the example of Cain. He says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. Who is that wicked one? The devil. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Why did Cain kill his brother? John asked the question, Why? Wherefore slew he him? Why did he kill him? And God gives the answer, Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. That's why. This is why Cain killed Abel. Cain was jealous. The first motivation for the first murder in the history of mankind was jealousy. That was the motivation for the first murder that ever occurred on earth. Jealousy. Envy. Envy. Cain was jealous. He was full of envy towards his brother because God approved of Abel and blessed him. But he did not approve and bless Cain. This envy made him murder his brother. Cain's works were evil. Why were they evil? Because he did all this work. He tilled the ground. He offered God the works of his own hands to cover up his sin. God did not accept that. Why? Because the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. The works of the law can never justify. The Bible says, no flesh shall be justified by the works of the law. The Bible says, if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you could be saved by trying to keep the commandments, by your good works, then Christ, Jesus, died in vain. There would have been no reason for Jesus to die on the cross. The Bible says you cannot be saved by your own works. You cannot cover up your sin with your own works. No matter how much you think you can, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. But what did Abel come with? He came with the lamb, with one of these sheep, as a sacrifice. And this was a type of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. 
He was pointing, Abel's sacrifice was pointing towards that day when Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, that Abel offered that sacrifice by faith. It says, by faith, Abel offered his sacrifice. And that made Cain angry. And that made Cain envious so that he murdered his brother. Verse 14 says this. Go down to verse 14 in 1 John chapter 3. We know. It's a fact. It's not we think. We feel. We feel strongly. No. We know it is a fact. That we have passed from death to li unto life. What does that mean? That means we know that we're saved. When you get saved, you pass from death unto life. You were dead in sins, then you're risen with Jesus Christ when you get saved. We know that we are past, we have passed from death unto life. How? Because we love the brethren. That's one of the main evidences of salvation that John the Apostle gives in his epistle over and over and over again. Because we love the brethren. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. He's dead in his sins. If you don't love your brother. And he gets even stronger in his language. Verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Anyone that claims to be a Christian and hates their brother is a murderer just like Cain and not a Christian. Anyone that hates their brother, that has no mercy towards their brother, that has no compassion and love towards their brother, that's how they don't express their love towards their brother, through their actions, through no mercy, through mocking. They're a murderer. They have gone in the way of Cain. Not in the way of Jesus Christ. Not in the straight and narrow way. Murderer. And we know, and ye know, that's the same thing that he said before. When he said, we know that we have passed from death unto life, he uses the same word. And ye know, it is a fact. It's not we feel strongly. It's not that it might be. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. We know that they're not saved. If they don't love their brother. We know that they're lost and they're going to die and go to hell if they don't repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Let's continue on in the Bible. There is another manifestation of the way of Cain. As we go down in history, in the book of Genesis, there's another incident where some men went in the way of Cain. The way of Cain manifests in Joseph's brethren. Turn on over to Genesis. We'll go over to Genesis. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to go through that chapter. Genesis chapter 37 starting in verse 1. Genesis chapter 37 starting in verse 1. Let me get a drink of water real quick. Verse 1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being seventeen years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Joseph came to his father and he said, Father, my brethren, my brothers, they are not living, they're not doing good. They are doing evil. He told his father report because his father, his fa the Bible says, honor your mother and your father. He didn't want to suffer sin upon his brethren and, and let them continue on in sin. He wanted his father to deal with his brothers so they would not continue to live in evil. So he gave his father that report. Verse 3, 
Now, Israel. Israel is the same as Jacob, in case anyone doesn't know. Jacob and Israel, same person. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. We, we know, we believe that you should love all your children. I believe you should love all your children the same. But this was the case with Israel. This is what happened. He loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Verse 4, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him, and could not speak peaceably unto him. Joseph's brethren hated him because they envied him. You see the pattern? You see the pattern of the way of Cain? It's all through the Bible. The way of Cain. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. Joseph's brethren hated the fact that God showed truth to Joseph. And it is the same today. If you're saved, if you are walking close with God, you pray to the Lord, you spend time in the Word of God, you're obedient to God, and God shows you truth. God shows you light. He bestows upon you blessings and gifts. Other people who are not walking close to God, who God does not give them that light, they will envy you. They will hate you. They will have murder in their heart against you. And they will do whatever they can to hurt you and to cast you out of your presence, to get you in trouble in any way they can, to make you look bad and make themselves look better because of envy. Verse 6, And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood up round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So at first it says they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Then it said, and they hated him yet the more. And then it says again in verse 8, and they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And the more that God showed Joseph, the more that his brothers hated him. The more that Joseph walked closer with the Lord, that he got, he got light and truth from God, the more that his brothers hated him. It just continued to grow and grow and grow and grow until it manifests and in action. Verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee? To the earth? What does it say in verse 11? And his brethren envied him. His brethren envied him. Once again, this is the way of Cain. Cain envied Abel. Therefore, he hated Abel and he murdered him. Joseph's brethren envied him. Therefore, they hated him. And murder was in their hearts. Verse 11, And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now when Joseph left his father, and he went to go see his brethren, Joseph had good intentions. See, Joseph didn't hate his brethren. Joseph loved his brethren. Joseph loved his father. 
Joseph genuinely wanted to help. He wanted to serve God. He wanted to serve his father. He wanted to love his brethren. But they didn't love him back. Verse 15. And a certain man found him. And behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. I seek my brethren. He was seeking for his brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. So like I said before, they envied him, and because they envied him, they would eventually, they had murder in their hearts, and eventually it would manifest in their actions. And now it is coming to fruition, and now they are conspiring against their brother to kill him, to murder their brother. Hatred for someone will eventually manifest in conspiracy to hurt or to kill that person. That's what hate in your heart will eventually manifest in when you hate someone, when you hate your brother. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. What were they doing? What were they doing? They were mocking. This dreamer cometh. What did we read in, in the epistle of Jude? That in the last time, mockers would come. Walking after their own ungodly lusts. Those are the mockers that go in the way of Cain. And here it is manifest again. That it is the same type of people. It's the same spirit. Those that want to murder are those that are mocking their brother. And they say, behold, this dreamer cometh. Oh, this dreamer. Verse 20, did Joseph ever do anything wrong to his brothers? The Bible doesn't say so. No, he didn't. But yet they mocked him and they hated him. You know, they mocked Jesus Christ when they crucified him to the cross. The Bible says that they mocked him. Verse 20, come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. Then we'll see what will happen to his dreams. Even in their plot, in their conspiracy, in their conspiracy to kill their brother, they were mocking. Then we'll see what will become of his dreams. It's this sadistic, dark sarcasm and hate, dripping with hatred. It's, it's evil in their hearts, manifesting in their mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. This is what Jesus said. They wanted to murder their brother and then lie about it. Then they wanted, after they hurt murder their brother, they want to lie about it. A lot of times when someone wants to hurt you, they have hatred towards you, when they do something wrong to you, then they want to lie about it to cover it up. Because they know what they did would make them look really bad. So they need a lie to cover it up to try to make themselves look better. But God knows the truth. Verse 21. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands. At least Reuben had some compassion for his brother. One of their brethren. One of Joseph's brothers had some compassion. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of the, their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So he said, Instead of killing him, let's take him, throw him in a pit, and then they would leave, and then Reuben was going to secretly come back later and rescue his brother out of the pit so he could bring him back to his father. That was Reuben's plan. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. And it came to pass 
when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. There was no water in that pit, like a well without water. And they sat down to eat bread. So right after they throw their brother in a pit, they sat down and to eat bread. How could you have an appetite to eat after you just threw your brother in a pit and you were planning on murdering him? How could you have the stomach to want to eat any food after that? Remember what the Bible says in Jude? Feeding themselves without fear. Feeding themselves without fear. They sit there and they eat after they just threw their brother in a pit. No fear. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh, and his brethren were content. They didn't care what happened to him. His brethren really didn't care what happened to him. So he said, okay, we'll just sell him to the Ishmaelites, and he'll be gone, and then we never have to see him again. That's what they thought. They didn't care what happened to him. And, hey, they can make some money out of the deal. Right? Make some money out of the deal covetous. So, and his brethren were content. Verse 28, Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. That reminds me of Jesus Christ, who was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver into the hands of his persecutors he was betrayed for a small amount of money. The Son of Man. The Son of God. Just like Joseph. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned unto the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit. Joseph was not in the pit. Reuben didn't find him. And he rent his clothes. Now that's a good response. That's a good response of a brother that's the reaction that you should have when you think, when you saw that your brother's gone, you don't know where he is. He could be killed. He could be taken. He rent his clothes because he was, he was sad. He was grieved. He was vexed because he didn't know what happened to his brother. That's a proper reaction to someone that actually has love towards their brother. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not. And I, whither shall I go? Now, I do believe that Reuben had some compassion towards his brother, but I also believe his other motivation was he wanted to bring him back to his father so he could receive the praise for that, and uh, he didn't want to see his father hurt. Because before, it said they all hated him. Didn't, it didn't exclude Reuben before. Nevertheless, this is what happened. Verse 31, And they took Joseph's coat, and killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. So what they do? They deceive their father with the bloody coat. Oftentimes liars will deceive people with a half-truth that seems very convincing. They came there, they took Joseph's coat, they dipped it in goat's blood, and they showed it to their father and said, Look, is this your son's coat? Yes, it is. Well, there you go. He must have been killed by a beast. Here's the evidence. Here it is. This is what happened. But was it true? No, it was a lie. It was a dirty, filthy, rotten lie. It was a lie. But they mustered up their evidence that they could to show and to lie and to deceive their father. 
to cover up their sin. The reason they lied was to cover up their sin. What did Cain do? After he had murdered his brother Abel, when God asked, where is your brother? He said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? He lied to cover up his sin. This is the pattern of the way of Cain. He, commit, he, hates, he hates his brother. He murders him. And then he lies to cover it up. That's the pattern of the way of Cain. Verse 33, And he knew it. This is Jacob. And he knew it, and he says, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Jacob mourned at the loss of his son. His brothers did not mourn, which is the proper response to losing someone you love because they hated him. They didn't mourn. They didn't mourn when they cast their brother in a pit. They didn't mourn when they sold their brother to the Ishmaelites. They were planning on murdering their brother. And now, look at the way that they grieved their father. Verse 35, And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. They did not care how badly they grieved their father. They didn't care. They didn't care how bad they hurt their father by making him think that a wild beast had killed his son, their brother, when they were the ones that wanted to kill him. They had no fear. They had no fear of God. They had no honor for their father. They had no love for their father. Not only did they not love their brother by wanting to murder him, by hating him, by throwing him in a pit and then selling him to the Ishmaelites. Not only did they not love him, they didn't love their father. They didn't care how they made their father feel by grieving him, making him think that his son was killed, that his son was dead. They didn't care because they had no love in them. Verse 36, And the Midianites and the Midianites sold him into Egypt, then to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. That is what happened to Joseph and his brethren. It was another manifestation of the way of Cain. The way of Cain is all throughout the Bible. And the way of Cain continues until this very day. There are many of those people today. Many people today who follow after the way of Cain. They call themselves Christians. They call themselves Bible believers. King James Bible believers. Sometimes they call themselves independent historic Baptists. But they follow after the way of Cain. They are ungodly men. And then we see the way of Cain manifest with Jesus Christ. Why did the religious leaders deliver up Jesus to be killed? Why did they do it? Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 15. Matthew chapter 27, verse 15. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner, I'm sorry, prisoner, called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? What does it say in the next verse? Verse 18. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. 
Even the Son of God was put to death because of envy by those that were supposed to be his brethren, the Jews. These are supposed to be Jesus Christ's people. Jesus Christ was born a Jew of the tribe of Judah in the lineage of King David. In the town of Bethlehem he was born. And the Jews, because of envy, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, those who claimed to love the Word of God, to preach the Word of God, to hold to the Word of God. Jesus said, the Pharisees and scribes sit in Moses' seat. They were supposed to hold the oracles of Almighty God. But because of envy, they delivered their Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. They delivered Him up to be killed. And they shouted, crucify Him. They said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. They cursed themselves with His blood because of envy. Because they went in the way of Cain. Nothing had changed in all those years. In almost 4,000 years or so, the same sin manifested in the way of Cain. When the Jews or the religious leaders and the Pharisees delivered up Jesus because of envy. They had murder in their hearts. To finish this up, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to examine from the scriptures. We're going to look at some contrasts between people that go after the way of Cain and those who go in the way of righteousness, the way of Jesus Christ. First one is the fruit of envy versus the fruit of righteousness. Fruit of envy versus the fruit of righteousness. It's in the book of James. Excuse me while I get the passage. Yeah, book of James, chapter 3, starting in verse 13. James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Someone says they have wisdom. You think they have, they have wisdom, they know the Word of God, they have knowledge of the Word of God? Okay. Well, here's what the Bible says. Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. He may say, or may he may appear by his words to have wisdom, to have knowledge, but the Bible says, let him show out of a good conversation. And in the, in the King James Bible, the word conversation doesn't just mean your mouth, your words, your conversation. It means your whole life, your behavior. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Meekness, humble, submission to the will of God. Verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, those are those that have gone in the way of Cain. They have bitterness in their heart. They, have, they are bitter people. They have bitterness in their hearts, and you can see it. It's manifested by their conversation, by their actions, that they are bitter. Bitter people. But if you have bitter envy, see, bitter bitterness goes hand in hand with envy. Because they're bitter, they can never be satisfied. They can never be satisfied with the blessings of God upon their own life. They have to envy what, how God has blessed someone else. And they go in the way of Cain after that envy. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, those who have gone in the way of Cain with their bitter envy, they always have strife. In fact, a lot of them love strife. They love controversy. They love strife. They love a good fight. They even brag about how much of a fighter they are. But they're not fighting for Jesus Christ. It's for their own glory. 
It's because of their bitter envying in their hearts. Glory not, the Bible says. Glory not. And lie not against the truth. This wisdom, that kind of wisdom that you, this, these people are supposed to have, this wisdom descendeth not from above. It does not come from God. These people are not of God. And they don't get any wisdom that they have. It's not from God. It descendeth not from above. But is earthly, sensual, devilish. It's devilish. It's of the devil. It's a counterfeit. It's not real. It's not godly. Earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Every evil work. Especially against those that live godly in Christ Jesus. Verse 17. Now look at the contrast. We look at the difference between the fruit of those who have envy in their hearts. The fruit of those who go after the way of Cain. But now let's look at the fruit of those who go in the way of righteousness. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that genuinely comes from God, it is heavenly, is first pure. It's pure. There's no hidden motives. There's no hidden intentions, hidden agendas. There's no bitterness in their hearts. They have love for God and love for neighbor in their hearts. They have hearts that are made Pure. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart. Their heart's been washed clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. But this wisdom, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. When you encounter someone that has the Holy Ghost within them, they strive to have peace if it is possible. They try to be gentle to people and not act like a barbarian and plowing them down and dominating people and talking over them and trying to control them and manipulate them. And they're not arrogant, full of pride and puffed up with a bunch of hot air. They're gentle and easy to be entreated. Easy to be entreated. Like it says in 1 Corinthians 13 about charity. It says, is not easily provoked. Easy to be entreated. If, if you have done something wrong, you can come to that person. Say, hey, I did wrong. And they say, you know what? That's okay. I forgive you. But these type of people, the ones that have gone in the way of Cain, they don't know how to forgive. All they know is bitterness and grudges, hatred in their hearts, and they have no compassion. No compassion. They don't know how to be entreated. All they know is strife in their hearts. There is no treaty with them. They cannot be entreated by anyone that disagrees with them. This wisdom is easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. You see that here? This is so important. Full of mercy. This is the way of Cain. When Cain killed his brother, when he murdered his brother, he showed no mercy. One of the characteristics of people that go in the way of Cain is they do not have mercy. They don't know how to show mercy. They'll lie about you. They'll try to hurt you. They'll try to ruin your reputation. They'll slander you. They will try to destroy your life because they have no mercy. They have no mercy. If someone doesn't know how to have mercy, they're not saved. That's a lost man. That's someone in the way of Cain. They have no mercy. Because God showed mercy towards us if we're saved. 
not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. If you're saved, you know that you deserve to burn in hell. You know you deserve to be punished for your wicked, filthy sin. But God, if you're saved, He had mercy on you. He forgave you all that debt. He forgave you all that sin. He had mercy on you. Remember when the Pharisee came up to the temple? And then, who came with him? The publican. What did the publican say? Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me. And he went away justified, but the Pharisee didn't. Because he thought he was better than the publican. But the publican understood the concept of mercy. And if you have received mercy from God, you will show mercy towards other people. If you don't show mercy towards other people, and you think that you can just lie about them, kick them out of your church, don't show any mercy, and don't think that you can have any compassion, and think that, you, that these people, that th you don't care if someone repents, if they get right, it doesn't matter to you. You're never going to have mercy on that person. Then you go after the way of Cain. You are just manifesting that you go in the way of Cain and not in the way of the Lord Jesus Christ in the way of righteousness because you have no mercy. And because you have no mercy, God will show no mercy to you unless you repent. Verse 17, full of mercy and of good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. If you have the wisdom that is from above, you're not going to have partiality in your judgment. You're not going to be a respecter of persons. And maybe treat those people better who have given you money. Better than others who don't give you much more money. Let's say if you're a preacher. You won't have partiality. Without hypocrisy. This wisdom will not have hypocrisy. You won't preach against things that you actually do. You will not condemn other people for the very things that you do. That was one of the biggest characteristics of the Pharisees that Jesus said. He said, woe unto you hypocrites. Hypocrites. Pharisees. They go in the way of Cain. Verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. If you've been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've made peace with God. You've made peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5. And when you make peace with God, you know it. You feel it in your heart that you have peace. It's the fruit of salvation. And when you have peace, you want other people to have peace. You want to make peace as often as you can. You don't want strife. You don't desire to create strife. You don't fuel and feed off strife. That's wicked. It's earthly, sensual, devilish, fleshly. You shouldn't feed off a strife. Yes, of course, sometimes when we preach the truth of the Word of God, when we contend for the faith, sometimes there will be strife. But that's not what we seek after. That's not what gets us going. We don't brag about strife and say, yeah, I like that. I like when people get mad. Why would you, why would you be happy about people getting mad? I know why. Because you don't actually care if they get saved. Because you have no mercy and you have no compassion. Because if you did have mercy and compassion, you wouldn't get a rise out of people getting angry at you and and uh, at being having strife and controversy and people getting angry at you and persecuting you. That wouldn't make you happy because you provoked people. That just makes you an ungodly bully. And that's the truth of the Word of God. Don't argue with me. Argue with the Word of God. Next, the fruit of those that consent to the words of Jesus versus the proud, covetous railers. 
Okay, turn on over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Almost done here. After 1 Timothy 6, then we're going to go to Matthew 23 and we'll be all done. But right here now, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 3. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. There it is, plain as day. That manifests who is of the way of Cain. If someone's in the way of Cain, what come, what's in their heart? What do they manifest in their life? Envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. That's how you know someone's in the way of Cain and they're not a Christian. They're of the devil. And of his lust they will do. They are proud knowing nothing, even though they pretend to know the Word of God. They know nothing. Verse number five. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. They don't have a sound mind. The Bible says, The Lord hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. These are men of corrupt minds. Corrupt minds. And destitute of the truth. Completely destitute of the truth. There is no truth in them. No matter how much they pretend. Supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. They suppose that gain is godliness. They suppose that because they get a bunch of hits on the... Uh, views on YouTube and a bunch of hits on Sermon Audio and because their church grows, that that's a sign that they're godly. That gain is godliness. But the Bible says, from such withdraw thyself. Get away from them. Get away from these people that say gain is godliness. That that's what they think. They're not right with God because they don't know God. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Someone lives a godly life. They're content. That's real gain. That's all that they need. They know all they need is Jesus Christ to do the will of God. They're satisfied to love God and love their neighbor. And you see the fruit in their life. You see the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, temperance, faith. You see all the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And they're content to live a godly life. They're not always trying to gain more and gain and gain and gain. Gain is not godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich, those that strive to be rich, to acquire more wealth, fall into, just for the sake of it, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now what's the contrast between this person that does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of her Lord Jesus Christ? They don't consent to the doctrine which is according to godliness. What's the contrast? What is the fruit of those that do consent to wholesome words? the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they do consent to the doctrine which is according to godliness. What is the fruit of those people? It says it right in verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Run away from those things. Don't you be caught dead being filled with pride. 
Don't be full of envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings. Flee these things. Run as far away as you can from those things. That is not of God. But instead, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's what you should follow after. That is the fruit of those that go in the way of righteousness, not in the way of Cain. This is the fruit. That's what they're following after. That's what the pattern of their life manifests. Faith and love, patience and meekness. Those that go in the way of Cain exhibit the fruit of, exact, of the exact opposite of these graces. And finally, to bring this message to a close, we will talk about the Pharisees who were the ultimate manifestation of the way of Cain. The Pharisees went into the way of Cain. We're going to Matthew tw chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 23, we're going to see how the Pharisees went in the way of Cain. Oh, and believe me, there's modern-day Pharisees today. Verse 23, how do you think Jesus preached this? I just want to know, do you think that Jesus said, Woe unto you? Think what he said? No. In fact, the time that he got angry in the Bible, the only main time that he got angry was at the Pharisees. That's who he got angry at. The fake religious leaders that pretended to be in the way of truth, but they were liars and hypocrites. That's who he got angry at. Verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe. Pharisees love to tithe. They love to brag about their tithe, giving money. Pharisees also like to accept the tithe. They love to accept the tithe and they love to get the money. They love it both ways. For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. What are the weightier matters of the law? What does Jesus say? Judgment. Mercy. There it is again. What is he saying here? He said the Pharisees have omitted, have omitted mercy. Pharisees didn't care about mercy. They showed no mercy. They didn't have the right judgment either. Their judgment was perverted. Kind of like if you, I don't know, if you had a church and you voted someone out but didn't give them a chance to answer the charges, that would be a perversion of judgment. Yeah, that would be omitting judgment. Judgment, mercy, and faith. They don't have real Bible faith. They have a pretend faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Always making a big deal out of nothing. Strife, envy. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. You can fool the whole world. You can put all your preaching online, and you can look like a great big polished whited sepulchre, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're dead. You're dead spiritually. Full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. How do you think Jesus felt about that? 
He didn't like it. You know, the Bible says that Jesus looked round about in them with anger for the hardness of their hearts. It made Jesus angry when he saw the hardness of their hearts. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Kind of like someone today that would say, well, we know and we preserve and we teach Baptist history. Well, yeah, we're the historic Baptists, right? We, we, we love the old, old prophets, right? We build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. righteous. We keep the history of the martyrs that shed their blood. We're the historic Baptists, right? And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. These, these people may say, we would have been the ones killed by Rome and the Protestants. Oh, us poor Baptists, we're like the Baptists of history, the Waldenses and the Novationists, and the Paulicians and Alba Albigenses. We were like them. That's who we are. We would have been killed by Rome. We would never have persecuted those poor Baptists. We're like them. You know what Jesus said? Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. You would have been the ones that killed them. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Who killed Abel? Cain. What was Jesus saying? He's saying they're the same spirit as Cain. They're in the way of Cain who killed Abel. It's the same spirit. From the blood of righteous Abel and to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechias, whom he slew. They, weren't, they killed him. And Jesus was saying they weren't physically there. But Jesus says, spiritually speaking, they were of the same spirit as those that did it. Because he said, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord.